Oh, we've come to the end of 2023. So here's my ranking of all 53 2023 releases that I saw from the worst to the best. In last place at number 53 is Paint. I have no idea who the audience for this movie is. Most of the jokes are lowbrow, crass, vulgar, or otherwise unfunny. So anybody who remembers Bob Ross is going to find the film immature, and the film is still far too adult for the teenager crowd who won't even understand the satire of the film anyway. This whole movie is just awkward to watch, and my deepest condolences not only to the family of the late Bob Ross who have to watch his legacy utterly distastefully destroyed, but also to Owen Wilson for having to star in this. The whole script is just awkward. There were only a small handful of jokes that actually worked, and even then they were mild chuckles at best, nothing too memorable. The film also has basically no plot or character development whatsoever. When it's not boring, it's awkward and painful, but I guess you can't spell paint without pain. Number 52, The Boogeyman. While this movie was tastefully executed and had great psychological horror, on a plot and character level, it's very thin. Nothing about it really stands out. I kept being reminded of other better movies that were very similar to this, such as Poltergeist, Lights Out, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, that all did it much better. The ending is heavy-handed, and it treats the audience like they're stupid. Number 51, Dashing Through the Snow. Absolutely nothing about it is something you haven't seen before. It's basically the Santa Claus mixed with a little bit of Home Alone, except it's not funny. Divorced Dad? Check. Main adult character who doesn't believe in Santa? Check. Santa who everyone thinks is just some random guy in a suit, but actually is Santa? Check. Villain who stopped believing in Santa because they didn't get the toy they wanted for Christmas as a kid? Check. Nothing about this movie breaks any new ground, and it feels like an assembly line movie without any Christmas magic. And who boy are the performances awful. Ludacris is too wedded, and the Santa is too over the top and tries too hard to be funny. The villains are lazy and forgettable. This is the same director as 2005's Fantastic Four and 2021's Tom and Jerry, and I honestly don't know how Tim's story keeps getting hired. My word was this awful. It's one of the worst Christmas movies I've ever seen, and everyone involved deserves a lump of coal. Number 50, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. They somehow managed to botch this movie even worse than Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Indiana Jones in this film was no longer the suave, handsome rogue that every teenage boy idolized. No, in this one, Indiana Jones is a depressed old man who was at his lowest point. He's not fun to watch. The film's writing is also incredibly stupid. And this is the follow-up to Crystal Skull, so that's saying a lot. The woman Jones is paired with in this is incredibly unlikable and annoying. She doesn't have the spunk or can-do attitude of Marion. She's basically Lara Croft. She's lazily written, has no charisma, and even worse dialogue. The plot is somehow even stupider than the last one. It's as if the writers saw people saying, hey, having aliens was the lowest point of the franchise. It can't possibly get worse, right? And they took that as a personal challenge. How did they manage to do this? By introducing time travel. Time travel now exists in Indiana Jones. You're welcome. It's bad enough they introduced this as a plot device, but they barely do anything with it. Though to some degree I'm grateful they didn't make going through time the entire plot, but time travel shouldn't even be in Indiana Jones at all. The villain's motivations are pretty milk toast. As bad as Crystal Skull was, I do at least remember Kate Blanchett and her motivations. As bad as that film was, she at least gave a fun performance. And that pretty much sums this movie up. It's trying to avoid the mistakes of Crystal Skull by not going as over the top this time, but at the same time it suffers greatly from an incredibly stupid script. I can at least remember how stupid Crystal Skull was, but there's nothing I'm going to remember about this movie in a couple years. I will say this, the first 20 minutes are really fun. A CGI DH Harrison Ford surprisingly works, and you can't even really tell it's CGI. We've definitely come a long way from Jeff Bridges and Tron Legacy. The first 20 minutes are a fun return to form and gave me false hope that that's what the rest of the movie is going to be like. But unfortunately, it's all downhill from there. The first 20 minutes would make a great pilot episode to a show, though given Ford's age, it would definitely have to be animated, and maybe give the voice work to all that Aaron Reich. He did a great Han Solo, and I feel he got the short end of the stick with that movie's reception. Bring it back. Have him voice a young Indy. Do an animated show. But quite sadly, we can include this film alongside that Willow Disney Plus series as Disney continuing to destroy the legacy of beloved characters one bad project at a time. Last Crusade was such a perfect ending. It had the perfect closing shot. If I had the MacGuffin from this movie, it would use it to go back in time to make sure the fourth and fifth films are never made. This movie doesn't belong in a museum. It belongs in the nearest landfill. Number 49, Good Burger 2. 
When I reviewed the first Good Burger, I said I had no nostalgia for it. I was born after it came out, and I didn't really get around to watching it until last year when I did Nick Member. And I said that I really liked it, though you'll probably only be appreciated if you're a fan of Dumb and Dumber or those kind of movies. I said that I was skeptical a sequel to the movie could work, because comedy sequels generally tend to not be very good. And unfortunately, I was right on the money with that assumption. This movie is pretty bad. It's not the worst movie I've seen this year, but my thoughts on it are not very kind. What works about it is Keenan Thompson and Cal Mitchell returning to their roles pretty naturally. It doesn't feel like any time has passed. But that's also a huge problem, because the characters haven't really developed that much. Cal is still the idiot, Keenan is still the straight man, and there are only so many jokes you can do with that setup. Especially because this movie is based on a sketch from a 90s show, so it gets pretty irritating pretty quickly. Keenan is still the idiot, and it's hard to suspend his belief that he's both still just stupid and still has his job, let alone that he's now the manager of the place. I can understand him being an idiot the first one because he's a teenager, but over 20 years have passed and he hasn't changed. How in the world does he still have a job? With all the times he screws up, how has he not been fired? A premise like that only works the first time around. The trailers didn't really tell you the plot of the movie, and I can see why. Because the plot is not good. It's more or less the same plot as the first one, though semi-updated. An evil corporation buys out Good Burger to franchise it and wants to replace all the workers with robots. That's really dumb. And not the kind of fun dumb that this movie should have. It doesn't really have anything new to say about the issue of AI replacing human workers either. It just kind of presents the issue, and that's it. I didn't find this one all that amusing, but bless Kenan and Kel, they are trying. They just aren't given that great material to work with. To me, this was a murder that was reheated in the microwave too many times. Number 48, Ruby Gilman, Teenage Kraken. Honestly, this movie's just odd. DreamWorks, for the most part, tends to make widely accessible, crowd-pleasing films. Exceptions to that being films like Boss Baby and Trolls, where those are clearly made for, like, little kids. And even then, I kind of like Trolls. This is a very specific age group and audience that I am not a part of. I compare this to the sequel to Spirit Stallion and the Cimarron. The first Spirit was a widely accessible movie, a western told from the perspective of a horse. And then you have the sequel, which was for horse girls, and not really anybody else. This is a movie where I have no idea who the audience is supposed to be because it's too mature for younger kids, but teenage girls and adults will probably find the film too childish. The movie is loud and annoying and the pacing is way too fast to let the audience process anything. And it's frustrating because this is the first original movie we've gotten from DreamWorks in a long time. It's not based on a book, it's not based on a show, it's not a sequel, and they want to reward them for their originality, but the execution of this idea really missed the boat. It's a shame, because it seems like there could be some fun ideas here. DreamWorks is no stranger to making sharp biting satire. Shrek, Megamind, Monsters vs. Aliens, those all take a very specific well-known idea or genre and do something that irreverently yet lovingly pokes fun at it. They could have had so much fun poking fun at mermaids. I mean, they obviously made the mermaid villain of this look like Ariel, and I'm sure it's not a coincidence that this came out around the same time as Disney's new Little Mermaid movie. But instead, we get a very safe teenager turns into a monster as a metaphor for puberty story, that was already done in films like Teen Wolf and Turning Red. The jokes aren't even that good. There were one or two that were mildly funny, but again, DreamWorks has proven when they want to do something really funny and heartfelt, they can. This one feels like a bare minimum of effort. I found it chaotic, loud, annoying, and frankly, pretty boring. Interesting concept, but it sucked when it came to the execution. Number 47, The Boys in the Boat. I will acknowledge this movie was well-directed, it had a good cast behind it, but I just had a hard time getting invested in the story. That doesn't make it necessarily a bad film, it just wasn't the kind of film I generally enjoy. It's hard for me to care about a railway competition. This is a true story, and the characters and relationships were there, but it also felt a bit lacking. This is a team of six or seven people, and the film really only focuses on one person, so it's hard to care about them as a team when we're only focused on the one. This is a movie for people in their 40s and up, and I'm not a part of that audience. It's well made, and if you want to see a sports movie a biopic set in the late 30s, this is for you. But unless you're in that very specific age group or niche, it probably won't be for you. Number 46, Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. On one hand, it's got comic book cheese, particularly with the battle scenes and scenes such as an underwater kingdom run by a fish equivalent of Jabba the Hutt. But on the other hand, the tone is uneven, the humor is lowbrow, and it's clear the studio was just trying to get this movie out because they didn't care about it. And if you don't care about your movie, why should I care about your movie? Jason Momoa works with what little he has, 
and the dynamic between him and Patrick Wilson can be enjoyable at times, but the film kept reminding me of Thor The Dark World, which is one of the worst films in the MCU. The film has an uneven tone. At certain points, it's too silly, and at other points, it's trying to seem important. And when I say silly, it's the level of silly I was afraid the first Aquaman was going to be. For me, The Flash is the true end of the DCEU. Don't waste your time or money. Don't even wait for this to drop on Max. You can skip it entirely. Number 45, Five Nights at Freddy's. I've been following the production of this movie since it was first announced, and it's gone through many scripts and many directors, and you can tell because the end result feels very muddled. It's just a huge mess. Now, somebody who's a casual fan of the games, haven't beaten the games, I played a few of each game, I haven't beaten them all the way through, but I appreciated the little references, the animatronic effects were phenomenal, but on a plot character level, it's pretty thin and somewhat lacking. I didn't really care about the main character played by Josh Hutcherson. I didn't think the stakes of that movie were all that high. And for a horror movie, it's surprisingly light on scares. The games are very creepy and there is some of that here, but the majority of it is spent dealing with childhood trauma and most of it feels like a completely different movie. This feels like a melodrama that on occasion has Five Nights at Freddy's characters sprinkled in there. There were only just a couple of jump scares and overall the tone of the movie is very confusing. The most interesting character is Matthew Lillard, and he's barely in it. Other than a mildly creepy atmosphere and impressive animatronic effects, the film doesn't really have much going for it. Number 44, Trolls Band Together. As someone who really enjoyed the previous two films in this franchise, I was a bit disappointed with this one. The writing for it was just... odd. Again, I can't really determine who the audience for it is. On one hand, it tries to entertain the 90s kids who are now parents with homages to 90s boy bands, but on the other hand, most of it comes off as really childish. The plot isn't really all that interesting, it has way too many side plots bogging it down. The villains in this movie also feel very out of place, based on the previous villains in the other two movies. The relationship between Branch and Poppy also feels very inconsistent. The film doesn't know if it wanted to mix them romantic or platonic. In the animation department, though, it shines, making each stop on this road trip have a different animation style that feels very unique. Overall, though, this movie felt pretty flat. Number 43, Leo. This was certainly more heartfelt than I was expecting. As hit or miss as Adam Sandler could be, this one actually had a genuine sweetness to it. The writing was sharp, the end result was adorable, and overall, this is a very feel-good family movie. The characters are all likable, it's solidly entertaining, and it has a lot of heart to it. You could tell they were trying to make a legitimately good film with a lot of passion. However, the way the plot flows does feel more appropriate for a TV show. The plot can be pretty repetitive at times. One kid takes home Leo, discovers Leo can talk, tells his or her problems to Leo, Leo helps to solve it, and this is repeated several times for the next 45 minutes or so with different kids. This format would have worked better as a show, with each kid being given a 10 or 20 minute episode, but as a movie it feels kind of repetitive. The other issue is that Sandler can be pretty annoying in this. He does the high-pitched New York accent that he thinks is funny, but is actually really grating, and it also doesn't really fit the character design. I wish he had done a performance where he could do his Dracula from Hotel Transylvania, where you can't even really tell it's him. But no, he does the same shtick he always does. And it gets really old, really fast. Also, this is a musical which I wasn't expecting, and there's practically no segue to any of these songs, so they feel like they come out of nowhere, and none of the songs are particularly memorable. Overall, though, I'm glad I watched it. It had a lot of sweetness to it. It was very heartwarming and a feel-good family film. Number 42, Peter Pan and Wendy. I liked this one fine. It didn't completely destroy the story. I thought it was at least a decent effort, but I have a few issues with it. One of the biggest issues being just how drab, gray, and lifeless this movie looks. Neverland is supposed to be a bright, vibrant landscape, but instead we get a place that looks like it's perpetually covered in fog with very muted colors. The other issue being there are girls and the Lost Boys. The whole point of Wendy being taken to Neverland is because Peter and the Lost Boys want a mother. They want that female influence, so when you put girls at the Lost Boys, it entirely defeats the purpose for her being there. The other issue is the tone of the film is just odd. It comes off more like Pirates of the Caribbean mixed with Maleficent, and they give Captain Hook a backstory to try to make him sympathetic. The film has some fun action, and Jude Law gives a great performance, but the tone and a lot of the story choices were very odd. But I at least admire they did try something different instead of just doing a shot-for-shot remake. Number 41, Creed 3. The ending to Creed 2 wrapped up everything so perfectly that I was skeptical about how a third one would turn out. My skepticism was correct and justified, because while the previous two Creed films had justification for their existence, continuing the legacy of Apollo created Rocky, this one does not. 
This one feels like it exists simply for the sake of doing a trilogy. I will say this, it's not as bad as Rocky V, because this film isn't boring, and in fact, the fights in this film are pretty adrenaline pumping and exciting to watch. The story isn't, in isn't very interesting, though, mainly because there is nowhere to take the main character after the previous film. The previous films were about Adonis Creed trying to live up to his father's legacy, by the end of Creed II, he has done that. His character arc has been wrapped up, which leaves absolutely nowhere to take his character in this one. So as a consequence, the film feels hollow with no stakes. The film didn't really give me that much of a reason to be invested. It just seems like it exists simply to make a trilogy. If you're a fan of the other Rocky movies and you don't care much about the story and just want to see some boxing action, it's worth the rent. But it's not like this movie completely turns the franchise on its head. If you're fine with something completely safe where you get exactly what you expect, it might work for you. But for me, I felt this film rang hollow. Number 40, Fast X. Jason Momoa is great as the villain in this, and they make him really evil instead of giving him a sympathetic backstory. But he's the only interesting character. John Cena's role in this film feels more like it was written for The Rock, and the whole time I kept thinking, man, I wish The Rock were still in this movie. He would have brought so much more charisma. But John Cena just feels like a diet soda version of The Rock. It also has great stunts, but the ending to it is very frustrating. Number 39, Elemental. Pixar movie that has a cool concept, but poor execution. On a story character level, it's very lazy and predictable and super, super heavy-handed. This is a Prejudice is Bad story, which we already did with Zootopia. And if Zootopia was too subtle for you, don't worry. This will really hammer home the point they're trying to make. Which is a shame, because the world of this movie they created is really fun. There's a lot of vibrancy, there's a lot of creativity, it's very nice visually, but all the jokes were used in the trailer. The problem is, there's not really any complexity to these characters. They only have one trait, and even then, they don't really overcome their flaws. And honestly, I think this movie would have worked better if the relationship between the two characters was platonic. Because since it's a forbidden love story, you get all the rom-com cliches. If the movie had gone, well, maybe we're not necessarily compatible as a couple, but we can still have a great friendship, that might have worked a lot better. I think it would have subverted the expectations a bit more. But instead, we get a cliche, lazy, heavy-handed story that's going to be forgotten pretty quickly. Number 38, Barbie. Sadly, this is a case where the trailers were better than the film. Now, I will say a lot of the movie is done very well. It has a lot of creative visuals, it can have a lot of smart humor when it wants to, and you can tell that all the actors and actresses in it are having fun. And while at the end of the day, the movie is very clearly aimed at women, presenting ideas about how Barbie has been criticized for giving young girls unrealistic beauty standards, and how Mattel is trying to move past that, present her as more empowering, it doesn't shy away from unrealistic body stance for men in the media either. However, at its expense, there is a lot of heavy-handed messaging. I lost count of how many times the word patriarchy was said in this movie. It seems like for every smart joke there was in this movie, there were heavy-handed moments that were there in an attempt to get applause from the audience. In particular, there's a scene near the end of the second act where a female character goes on a monologue about society's expectations and criticisms of women, and it goes on for like a full minute. It feels like a scene in a Christian movie where the main character will look directly at the camera and say, Hey audience, this is what we want you to think. Get the message? Have we drilled it in yet? The movie feels like two different writers had two very different ideas and tones of what they wanted the movie to be. It feels like someone wrote the first two thirds as a fun SNL-style self-aware parody, but they ran out of ideas. So they handed the writing over to somebody else for the third act. That person said, Okay, this is good, but we need a message! The film starts off very similar to the Lego movie or Free Guy, where the main character is this perpetually happy, naive personality who then has an existential crisis. And the third act basically just rips off the Stepford Wives or Get Out, which is a weird direction for the story to go. It doesn't feel built up to, it just comes out of nowhere. And it's hard to tell who the movie is for. It's PG-13, it has a fair bit of sexual innuendo, as well as mature social commentary, but at the same time it feels so heavy-handed that it can kind of lose the plot. I'm slightly disappointed because this movie was marked as something it wasn't. At the end of the day, my biggest criticism is the same as the biggest criticism people have had about the Barbie doll herself. The plot and doll are just a bit too thin. Number 37, Spy Kids Armageddon. This was honestly a pleasant surprise. Based on the trailer, I thought this was going to be a completely unwatchable rehash, but surprisingly there is still some life in this franchise. However, on a plot level it is pretty weak. There's not a lot of new ideas, it feels very much like a reboot of the first film, and an amalgamation of the other two films in the trilogy, rather than a true sequel. If you're expecting it to be like the fourth movie, where it's a legacy sequel, and they bring in the actors from the previous films, that's not what you're going to get. It is very much a standalone film, 
and has aimed less at adults who grew up watching the other movies and has aimed more towards kids of today. There's no nostalgia baiting, it's very much its own thing, but that's also kind of a detriment. There are a lot of scenes in this movie that are beat for beat the first film. The basic plot feels very much like a remake of the first one. There's a cute robot bug in the second film, the villain is an evil video game designer just like in the third one. There's not a lot of new ideas being brought to the table here, which is a shame. Now, I saw in the credits that Robert Rodriguez's son was one of the writers on this, and his daughter sings a song in the credits, so it's kind of cool that his kids, who were kids when the originals came out, are working with him on this new one. But it's also a shame that they couldn't think of something more creative with the story. I've always said, I'm not against doing reboots or remakes if you could do something really new and creative with it, but this film didn't do that. But I can't really complain that much. I mean, Spy Kids, Shark Boy, Lava Girl, Shorts, those have all been films pretty much exclusively for kids, so it's right in line with those. And Robert Rodriguez really does know what's going to entertain kids, how kids think, and I did like that this movie did sort of update the story for a new generation. The first three films came out around 20 years ago, and I was watching them when I was a kid, and that makes me feel old, but they do still hold up. But at the same time, technology has changed in 20 years, especially gaming, which is what this movie focuses on. And if you're a kid, it's really going to speak to you. And thank goodness that it's a very clean film. There aren't any mixed messages or messages I wasn't comfortable with if I had kids. I have relatives and friends who are parents of young kids who are always looking to me for movie recommendations for their kids. And I usually have to put a disclaimer when I recommend something. This movie's good, but there's some language, or there's a moment of innuendo, or there's some iffy messaging. This movie had none of those things, which is more than I can say for even the Spy Kids movies I grew up with. Because even rewatching them, I noticed that Carmen uses a substitute for a certain curse word of those. But this movie doesn't even have that. So this is a movie you can feel good about putting on for your kids. As an adult, it's not going to do much for you, especially if you're someone who did not grow up with the other movies. But I thought this movie was fine. It's harmless, it's cute, and if you have kids, I would recommend it, but only for them. 36. Migration. It's a big problem when the trailers for the movie only serve to remind you of other better films from the studio rather than showing you much footage from the film it's advertising. In this case, that's because the film doesn't really have much to offer in terms of story or characters. As far as kids' films go, it's certainly passable. At times, there can be a bit of charm to it, but kids are really the only ones who are going to get anything out of this. It's yet another animated road trip movie, and as such, uses the same formula in other family road trip movies, this time being a bit more reminiscent of DreamWorks The Croods. It also has a very similar villain to 1978's The Muppet Movie. The first half doesn't really have much going on, and the main conflict, as thin as it is, doesn't really show up until the second half. There's also a certain subplot that's introduced in the first 10 minutes about one of the ducklings having a crush on another duckling, and it doesn't affect the plot at all. She shows up again near the end, and by that point, I had forgotten about that subplot. The jokes are also aimed more for little kids. It's not low-brow, but it's not really here where the adults are gravitate towards. It's more slapstick. When it lacks a plot and humor, though, it at least makes up for an animation. It still has that distinct illumination style and design, and yet it's still very expressive and energetic. It's also a very clean kids movie, and I have no idea why it's PG. To me, I would rate it G, but it's for very little kids. I would say I rent this film for them, it'll entertain them for 90 minutes. Don't rush out to see it, just wait for streaming, and put it on for them while you get work done. Number 35, Wish. The plot really is not all that interesting, the pacing is wonky, and the songs are pretty bad. I only remember like two songs from this movie, and one of them was the villain song. And even then, the villain song was not that great. And at times, the lyrics to the songs don't really make a lot of sense. I hope the songwriters never come back to do another Disney project, because good golly, were these songs a miss. The characters are also pretty forgettable, aside from Alan Tudyk as the comic curly fanable sidekick, and maybe Chris Pine as the villain. I'm not really going to remember these characters. This movie feels like it was made just to cram a few Easter eggs that remind you of much better Disney movies. And the villain is not that evil. I don't know what the problem has been with Disney writing villains for these past 10 years, but all the villains except for Hans have been pretty generic. It's like they're afraid to write classic, easy-to-hate villains like they used to do with Frollo, Scar, Jafar. This is not a movie I think of when I think Disney. It's not this big, grand adventure. It's just Disney patting themselves on the back. And I do find it ironic that this movie is about people being denied wishes by their cult leader like that's somehow a bad thing, when this movie is pretty much what diehard Disney fans are. To some people, Disney could do no wrong ever, and this movie is for those people. For me, who actually sees flaws and critiques things, I wish we had gotten a better movie. Number 34, A Haunting in Venice. This was a very well done creepy film. I appreciated the atmosphere of horror as well as the psychological horror elements. That was tastefully done. And surprisingly, the best performance in this movie comes from Tina Fey. Tina Fey in a non-comedy film isn't something you usually see, and she's quite good at this. 
jump scares in this movie are also very effective and feel earned as opposed to very cheap. While the cast of characters aren't as good as Murder on the Orient Express or Death on the Nile, the pacing is tight enough to keep the audience invested. The biggest problem with Death on the Nile was the pacing was very awkward. Brad has clearly learned from the mistakes of the predecessor and tightened this film up a bit more. This film creeped me out in the best way, and the film really likes to play with the audience regarding what is real, what's fabricated, and what, if anything, is supernatural. This was an effective, well-done little horror flick, and I'm eager to see Brandon's next adventure as Detective Poirot. Number 33, Next Goal Wins. I love Taika Waititi's previous work that I've seen. I enjoyed Jojo Rabbit, Thor Ragnarok, and to some degree, I'll even defend Thor Love and Thunder. However, I'm not really a sports movie fan. I was anticipating this movie more as a Taika Waititi fan and the fact that my uncle actually is from American Samoa. And I got what I was expecting, and maybe even a little bit more. Taika Waititi's signature humor is on display here, preventing a very witty script and balancing the dramatic moments as well. The dialogue is sharp and witty, especially in the moments of culture clash with the American coach essentially being a fish out of water, if you're part of the cliche, and trying to learn the culture of American Samoa to coach their soccer team are failing tremendously. The film is based on a true story, so I can't really blame it for some of the sports movie cliches, but at the same time, that is Hollywood trying to make the film more exciting using a familiar formula. The second act also suffers from a few pacing issues that feel more like filler and should have sped up a bit more. The film is very well directed, and the cinematography of American Samoa is gorgeous, and I enjoy learning a few things about the culture, even though, like I said before, I'm not big into sports. I still felt the tension and excitement of watching the soccer matches and training montages, even though they felt a bit familiar. Now, this isn't a movie that I would say you should really rush out to see. In my opinion, it's perfectly fine to wait to stream it. If you're a takeaway TD fan, you'll probably enjoy it. If you're a sports fan, you'll probably enjoy it, even if it is a bit familiar. But if you don't fall into at least one of those two audiences, it's probably not for you. And speaking of sports movies, number 32, Champions. I thought this was a sweet little movie with a lot of heart and a good message. Now, like I said, I'm not typically somebody who gravitates towards sports movies. To me, the majority of them seem the same. The main character is always the coach who is either the nicest guy who believes in the team or he's the jerk who gives a bit of tough love. However, there's always, you know, that there's always a training montage. There's always a big dramatic twist where you think they might lose. There's the slow clap. To me, if you've seen one of these movies, you've seen them all. But for the most part, this movie doesn't really do a lot of that. It still has the jerky coach's heart has changed trope, but that's really it. The plot is a bit overly familiar. It has basically the same plot as the Adam Sandler movie Eight Crazy Nights, though most of the humor is not quite as lowbrow, and is certainly more charming. Now, like I said, I'm a big follower of sports, so I didn't really understand a lot of the basketball terminology, but the characters are what make this movie. They are all so lovable, and you just want to give them all a big hug. They are genuinely sweet and reflect the best of humanity. What's disappointing about this film, however, is the amount of sexual content, somewhat off-color humor, and profanity that make it PG-13. It could have so easily been PG, but no, they had decided to go edgy. Despite those disappointing elements, though, Champions is a genuinely heartfelt, funny movie. It's not overly sappy, it doesn't feel manipulative, it all feels genuine, and in my book, that's a slam dunk. Number 31, The Little Mermaid. I love the director, Rob Marshall. I thought Into the Woods and Mary Poppins were actually pretty good. They're not fantastic, but they're watchable. And this is his best movie. It's not perfect, but it's the one I feel that he tried the hardest for the most part. So I'm going to be comparing the two versions. Some things in this version were done better, and some things I feel could have been left out or done differently. One of the differences was the difference I was fine with. In the original, all of Ariel's sisters start with A. In this, their names are named after the seven seas, and each sister is a different race. One's white, one's Asian. There's another one besides Ariel who's black, which makes sense because Triton is Poseidon. He's a Greek god, and if you know anything about Greek mythology, you know Greek gods aren't necessarily monogamous. It makes sense for him to have daughters from different mothers. And Halle Bailey kills it as Ariel. Her voice is amazing. And surprisingly, Melissa McCarthy also gives a really good performance as Ursula. I don't really like Melissa McCarthy in anything. I find her very annoying. But here, she disappears out of the role, and I completely forgot it was her. I saw Ursula, not Melissa McCarthy. Much like how Will Smith played the genie Aladdin, he took the base of what was in the original and made it his own. She does that here, too. She absolutely kills it during her version of Poor Unfortunate Souls. They also fixed one of the plot holes of the original with this scene. In the original, Ariel signs a contract, which means she knows how to write. So why not just write down, hey, I'm the girl who rescued you. Here's what I need you to do to save me. In this version, it's changed to Ariel making a blood oath. Now, there are a few plot inconsistencies. The beginning of the movie is sailors talking about how they're scared of the mermaids who lure sailors to their deaths with their siren songs. All except Eric, who doesn't believe the stories. Interesting way of changing it. 
Except 20 minutes later, when Ariel first sings Eric, they're singing the Fathom Blow song with none of the lyrics changed. Personally, I think it would have been more interesting if they had changed the lyrics to Sir Moore's warning. But making it so the series fear them remains also gives a nice parallel to Ariel and Eric. Ariel is told the humans are bad, but doesn't believe it. Eric is told mermaids are bad, but doesn't believe it. The townsfolk are superstitious about the mermaids because there's been a lot of shipwrecks. Later on, when Ariel is exploring Eric's castle, she sees that Eric collects things related to mermaids in the sea, just like how she collects things about the human world. It's a nice way of making it feel like a real relationship instead of just rushed into. <clears throat> also, Eric also gets his own I Want song, and it reminded me of the song Evermore from Beauty and the Beast. Ursula in this version is Triton's sister, Ariel's aunt, which gives her a personal vendetta against them and makes her motivations more similar to Scar. Now, like I said, there are a few issues. One being the film is live action. So as a result, characters like Sebastian, Scuttle, and Founder look terrible. It's the same problem Lion King had. Also, the Undersea song is not as energetic. Javier Bardem gives a mixed performance. He's not as bad here as he was in Pirates of the Caribbean 5, but I still think he could have done better. And I like Lynn Meta Miranda, and I know he's a huge fan of Alan Bacon, so much so that he named his son Sebastian, but his style of music does not work here. Not only does he write a rap song for this, he used it to Scuttle, who's played by Aquafina, and she's annoying. She's annoying at everything, she's annoying here. And also, he gives Ariel a song after she's on land for the first time. And it's a great song. It reminded me of How Far I'll Go from Moana, which he also wrote. But I think the scene of Ariel exploring the human world would have been more effective with just score and letting Halle Bailey's facial expressions do the communicating. She has no voice at that point. Take advantage of that limitation. Another issue is when Ursula turns into a human to trick Eric into thinking she's the one who rescued him. She's white. I know Eric didn't get a good look at Ariel, but even when your vision is blurry, you can still tell differences in skin tone. I know he's under a spell, but come on, don't make him that dumb. Overall, though, I do think this was a nice new version of the film. It was different enough that it didn't just feel like the original, and it was still one of the better live-action remakes. This film is a siren whose spell I fell under. Number 30, Ladybug and Cat Noir. Let me start off by saying yes, I have seen the show this is based on, and I love it. And no, you do not need to have prior knowledge of the show to watch this movie. Which is both helpful and a detriment. It's helpful because the movie stands on its own, separate from the show, but it's a detriment because it shines a spotlight on the film's biggest issue, the pacing. The show is pretty repetitive and formulaic. Someone in the city will start to experience strong negative feelings, the villain will use his powers to give them superpowers to get revenge on those who wronged him, Ladybug and Cat Noir are called into action, they defeat the villain, the main villain throws revenge, repeat, repeat, repeat. This formula works fine for a 20-minute cartoon, but trying to stretch it out to a 90-minute movie, you run into some problems. About halfway through the film, it kind of loses the narrative and starts to feel rushed. You can tell the writers are used to writing for 20-minute episodes and not film. However, the irony is there's more character development for the main characters in a 90-minute movie than there's been in five seasons of the show. I really need to praise the animation here as well. This is some of the most gorgeous, smooth animation I've seen in animated film recently. I could make an entire separate video raving about the animation alone. I really wish this movie had gone to theaters to the Netflix, because I would have loved to see this animation on the big screen. However, the film can be a bit chaotic at points, particularly the action sequences. When I heard this was going to be a musical, I thought, okay, cool, an animated superhero movie musical. That could be kind of unique. I wonder what they're going to do with it. They do the bare minimum. Seriously, apart from Hawkmoth's villain song, I don't remember any of the other ones. And even then, the villain song is just kind of cool visuals and choreography, but somewhat forgettable lyrics. It reminded me a bit of Be Prepared or In the Dark of the Night with its great aesthetic and the villain's minions chanting. <coughs> but it doesn't feel as powerful as those songs. There's one other love song kind of near the end, but it felt like a ripoff of Rewrite the Stars from Greatest Showman. Also, I don't know why they made this decision, but for some reason, Marinette's dialogue voice actress and singing voice actress are two completely different people. It was such a jarringly odd decision to make. It's not like the voice actress can't sing. She's sung as Marinette on the show before, and she even has her own YouTube channel where she does professional song covers and original music. Was it scheduling conflicts? I don't know. But whatever the reason, it really took me out of it because they don't sound similar at all. It's like Jack Skellington in Nightmare Before Christmas because they don't sound similar at all. His speaky voice is different when he sings, and it's very clearly Danny Elfman singing it. It also felt like they wrote the songs first, and tried to formulate some sort of bare minimum plot around the songs. Overall, though, I thought this was a cute, sweet, fun little movie. Nothing miraculous, but a decent way to kill time. It's a good family movie to watch with your kids, and not much else. It's not particularly complex and memorable, it's just fun, 
but considering this is based on a cartoon, that's about all I could ask for. Number 29, Polite Society. I thought this movie was creative and very fun. It has the sisterly love message of Frozen, the creepiness of Get Out, and a little bit of Scott Pilgrim thrown in as well. All against the backdrop of a Bollywood martial arts movie. It's visually creative, the martial arts sequences are fun, the writing is sharp, it has a great twist, the film starts off one way and it gets more absurd as the film goes on, but it still manages to feel like there's clear direction and it doesn't feel super all over the place. Number 28, Flame and Hot. I know this movie is not technically a true story, but that's what Hollywood does. They exaggerate details, they omit details, things get changed. Movies like Elvis, Greatest Showman, Eddie the Eagle, you can't tell me that those are all 100% accurate. I don't mind if certain things are spiced up a bit if it means the story is good. And honestly, yeah, this is a really charming little film and is one of the most inspiring films of the year. It shows that no matter your position in life, you have the potential to make your life how you want it, even if it takes a lot of hard work and you face setbacks and failures along the way. The main character is this guy who didn't make the best decisions in life. He faced a lot of racism and discrimination being a Mexican immigrant, and he started out by doing drugs, stealing, committing other crimes, but he finds religion, he finds a supportive girlfriend, eventually his wife, and he works really hard to get a job. But nobody will hire him because he's Mexican and he's not super educated, but he does eventually get a job as a janitor at Frito Lay. And Frito Lay at the time is having some cutbacks. They're needing to lay off employees at the plant where he works, and he notices Frito Lay doesn't have a large variety of flavors. He gets the idea to experiment with different spices, and eventually he finds a recipe for flaming Hot Cheetos. And that's all I'm going to say. That's basically just the plot, but there is a lot more to it than that. This movie is also a lot funnier than I was expecting it to be. There's a lot of really snappy dialogue in this movie. I got quite a few good laughs. But this is a Hollywood underdog story. And as such, you're going to get all the Hollywood underdog story cliches. Supportive wife, wise friend, evil corporate monster, a man who's always putting them down. The closest thing I can compare this to is Rocky, the first one. It's very similar to that in terms of the narrative structure, so it does have a few of those tropes. Despite those elements, though, I had a good time with it. I found it very entertaining with likable characters who want to see succeed. I found it very inspiring and uplifting. This is one of the feel-good movies of the year that everyone can get something out of and be inspired by, even if at times it's a bit cheesy and the story may have been exaggerated to spice things up. If you want to see a feel-good underdog story, give it a watch. Number 27, Haunted Mansion. Eh. It had a great cast, fantastic visual effects, especially the villain, but I found the story thin and a bit uninteresting. I liked how they gave backstory to the ghosts, and the film has Easter eggs and references galore for fans of the ride, but there's not much else. I was also disappointed by how dark the movie was. I know it's PG-13, but so are the Pirates of the Caribbean and Jungle Cruise, and those managed to still keep the fun, upbeat tone of their respective rides they're based on. This one does not. The Haunted Mansion ride is pretty lighthearted, but this film is dark. I didn't feel that it matched the tone of the ride at all. Say what you will about the Eddie Murphy version, but at least that one got the tone right. It has fun performances, and I was surprised by how great Jared Leto was as the villain, but overall I found this movie pretty thin and forgettable. This is one mansion tour I won't be taking again anytime soon. If you're a fan of the ride, I guess you might find a few things to enjoy, but other than that, it didn't work for me. Number 26, Blue Beetle. Originally, this was supposed to be a direct distributed film for HBO Max, but after they made some management changes, they decided to put it in theaters. But you can tell based on the script that it was made for streaming. It's an enjoyable film, but I'm glad that after the big multiverse event that was The Flash, this one just decides to be its own cute little standalone story that's smaller scale. Is the story well executed? Well, in some ways it's a little bit derivative of other superhero films, particularly Ant-Man, Spider-Man, and Venom. You got the main character who, just like Scott like from Ant-Man, can't seem to catch a break, and then finds a tech suit from a big evil corporation. I mean, the villain even looks like the villain from the first Ant-Man film. You got the awkward teenager humor of Spider-Man. You got the character making jokes in symbiote like Venom. In terms of the story and script, it's not the most original, but it is still very fun. It's got lots of good humorous moments. It's got a charming main character, but story-wise, it has a few issues, particularly with the pacing. It feels at times like it doesn't know when to speed up and when to slow down. But the film was a refreshing change of pace for a market oversaturated with big explosive comic book movies by being a smaller story that feels more human and personal. Even if at times it feels like it's taking inspiration from other superhero movies and the villain is super generic, I still had a good time watching it. Number 25, The Marvels. If you've seen my MCU rankings, you know I'm not the kindest when it comes to the previous Captain Marvel film. And while at the end of the day I did enjoy the Ms. Marvel Disney Plus show, I found its narrative structure a bit odd, and the tone was definitely for younger fans. 
And while I wasn't completely put off by the trailers for this, I wasn't completely sold on it either. <laughs> Combined that with pretty much mixed word and naked mouth about this movie over the past few days, I was expecting it to be pretty forgettable. But this is the most pleasant surprise I've had at movies this year, and some of the most fun. The first Captain Marvel movie I found pretty lackluster. <coughs> <coughs> trying to be another Guardians of the Galaxy film. This one, in terms of the tone, feels like its own thing. It feels less derivative of Guardians of the Galaxy and more like something else. Even some of the shots in this movie are stylized like a comic book. And that's what I got, a fun comic book movie. It has scenes that I found wildly creative. There's a part where they go to an alien planet and the aliens they meet are pretty fun. The filmmakers took what worked about the first one and expanded on it. Everyone loved to use the cats and now we get tons of his offspring. And what they do with these adorable but deadly kittens was one of the funniest scenes in the whole movie. In the first movie, I found Carol to be a pretty bland character, but here it actually feels like she has character flaws and overall is better written. But the performance that absolutely steals the whole movie is Amon Vellani as Ms. Marvel. Do you love the infectious energy of Tom Holland's Spider-Man when he meets his heroes? Imagine a whole movie of that. The actress seems genuinely excited to be in the movie, and she is a delight. But we do have certain issues. For one, the movie does require homework. If you haven't seen WandaVision or Ms. Marvel recently, you're going to be lost. The other issue is the villain is pretty forgettable. Remember Ronan from Guardians of the Galaxy? Yeah, hardly anybody does. This villain is basically the girl version of Ronan, and she's just as forgettable. But the majority of this movie, I had a massive grin on my face. It wasn't afraid to have fun, have some good humor, and well-stylized action scenes. I would say overall, it's worth seeing. Just make sure you do your homework first. Number 24, Scream 6. I was pleasantly surprised by how much I enjoyed this one. I like what they did with Jenna Ortega and Melissa Barrera's characters. I enjoyed how they connected some of the characters to the villains of the other movies. I think setting the film in New York made the film feel a bit more fresh. I enjoyed this one almost as much as the original Scream. Number 23, Chicken Run, Dot of the Nugget. I was pleasantly surprised by how much I enjoyed this one. The trailers didn't really sell me on this. It seemed like it was going to be a retread of the first one. And while to some degree that is true, such as having the same villain, it's still clever and unique enough to justify its existence. The trademark argument humor and visual gags are sprinkled throughout, and whereas the first film was an homage to prison breakout films, this sequel is an homage to spy films, and it cleverly satirizes all the tropes found in those films. The stakes are even higher in the sequel as Rocky and Ginger need to save their daughter from a chicken nugget factory. While I'm disappointed they used the same villain as the first one, I still found this film clever and delightful. Chicken Run, Dawn of the Nugget is a sequel worth squawking about. Number 22, Gran Turismo. As somebody who doesn't really gravitate towards sports films and has tried to get into NASCAR but never really saw the appeal, I really enjoyed this movie. Yeah, it feels like a long commercial for the video game, but there's such a charm to it at the same time. Neil Blomkamp is such a great director that he can make something like watching someone set play racing simulator actually exciting. There's also a lot of drama and stakes to the film, though one of them being the main character is a dad who doesn't understand him and his dream is a bit cliche and Disney Channel movie-esque. I found this movie very exciting, fun, and dramatic. Whether you're a fan of racing, gaming, or just want to see a well-directed film, this movie has something for everyone. Number 21, Missing. To some degree, it's not as good as the first movie called Searching, but it also does things in this one that are a bit better. The main issue is it is kind of the same as the first one, except instead of a father looking for his missing daughter, it's a daughter looking for her mom, and they do reuse a few plot elements from the first one in the beginning. That being said, you do not need to have seen the first one to understand this one. It still works very well on its own. And honestly, if I hadn't seen the first one, I wouldn't have noticed the similarities. So this wouldn't even be complaints. This is a very intense movie. To some degree, the novelty of having everything shown through laptops and phones doesn't work a second time, because the first film was kind of a novelty. But this movie is still very intense and engaging. I was on the edge of my seat for a lot of it, and even heard some of the people in the theater start cursing at a lot of the twists because they were so surprised. There's even one or two scenes that kind of feel like they're from a found footage horror movie. The first act is a bit slow, but it's a good slow. There weren't any big problems that drew attention to the pacing, and getting to the second half of the film is worth it because there are twists, twists, twists. The film also has a bit of clever commentary on society's obsession with true crime documentaries. It's all interesting to watch until it happens to you. The score in this movie is also very chilling. Most of the film has no score, but when it does, it's intense. Even though to some degree it's kind of the same, it's still a worthy follow-up, and in some ways this is a slight improvement. Number 20, Wonka. I think Roald Dahl would be very pleased with this charming new version of Wonka. Timothy Chalamet is very charming in the lead role. Fans of the original 1971 film will recognize plenty of callbacks and references. This film is a delight for all ages. 
Adults will enjoy it. Kids will enjoy it. While the songs aren't as memorable as the Gene Wilder and Johnny Depp versions, there's still a little bit of a charm to them. The film does have a few pacing issues, and Walker doesn't always feel like the same character we meet in the original, but the idea of the villains of the movie being a chocolate mafia is delightfully zany. That being said, the film doesn't really know what genre it wants to be at times. Sometimes it's a musical, sometimes it's a mafia film, sometimes it's a heist film, but overall it has just the right mix of just the right ingredients to be scrubbed and amptious and full of pure imagination. Number 19, Megan. While creepy doll movies have been around since the days of Twilight Zone, the film is unique enough to stand on its own. The film has commentary on how technology affects kids and how parents sometimes go too far with letting technology be the babysitter. It also does a great job of providing a solution to the problem. The practical effects and CGI are both impressive. The tone is a bit more campy rather than scary. It's a nice throwback to cheesy 80s B-movies, but still has 2023 filmmaking techniques. The end of the second act has been contrived, though. I also wish there was a bit more of a mystery element. Is there a lot evil, or is something else going on? Plants of red herrings, mess with the audience a bit. Overall, though, I just had a lot of fun with this horror movie. Scene 65. One of the most original movies I've seen in a while, and incredibly well done. Out loud, the premise, Adam Driver fights against dinosaurs in space, sounds really stupid. But the film is actually really well done. It's not as campy as the premise would have you believe, while also being careful not to take itself too seriously, losing all credibility. It's the right amount of both, and it's actually really intense. It harkens back to the scares and thrills of the original Jurassic Park film, and it's actually closer to what I was hoping Jurassic World Dominion was going to be, trying to survive on a planet inhabited by dinosaurs. But instead, that film gave us a plot about engineering wasps to control the food population. This is more along the lines of what that should have been, an intense thriller with jump scares and action. And for a movie with only two main characters, it's fantastic. Adam Driver gives a fantastic performance. It really gives a lot of emotion, making you care about his survival. The little girl he finds on the planet and takes in is also well written. She doesn't speak, but as the film goes on, she starts to apply survival lessons she learns from Adam Driver, and they made her really resourceful. She's helpless enough that she gives Adam Driver stakes to his character, but resourceful enough that she's an actual character, not just a plot device. And like I said, the movie is really intense. There's a lot of jump scares and a lot of intensity. I was kept fully engaged. My only real criticism is that the first act feels a bit rushed, and the third act wraps up a bit too quickly. The movie is only around 80 minutes, and I think it could have benefited from being a solid two hours. It feels like there was some last-minute studio executive meddling, but the majority of the film I had a blast with. It's a shame a lot of people probably won't see it. Hopefully it gets better word of mouth. It's well-made, it's intense, it's dramatic, and it's thrilling. Number 17, Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. I really enjoyed this. I thought the quantum realm was very creative. I thought Catherine Newton worked well with Paul Rudd. But in terms of the tone, it's definitely the most serious of the three Ant-Man films. There is still some humor, but not nearly as much as the previous two, so it's kind of an odd tone shift. Michael Pena and the other comic relief from the previous two films aren't in this one, even as cameos, which is a little bit disappointing. And Bill Murray, I think, was wasted a bit in this film. They don't really give a lot to do. However, the film style is a big, grand spectacle, whereas the other two films were relatively small-scale. It was still entertaining, but it definitely had a very different tone than the other two films. Number 16, Shazam! Fury of the Gods. This takes everything that worked about the first Shazam and expands it. The story, for the most part, is a lot richer, the villains are a lot better written, the humor is a lot stronger, and the ideas from the first film are expanded on really well. However, what holds it back just a smidge is that Billy's character arc in this one I don't think is as interesting. In the first film, he was obsessed with finding his birth family, and then by the end of the film, learned to accept his adopted family, and there isn't much left to do with him in this film as a result. He's willing to sacrifice himself in this film for his family, but I didn't feel like his character growth was as strong, he didn't feel as conflicted, and at the end it feels a bit deus ex machina. But, given that the film focuses heavily on Greek multicultural and the term deus ex machina comes from that, I'm going to give it a pass, because I think it fits within the world and rules of the film. Most of their films I'd be a lot harsher for doing something like that, but this film does, but I think it makes sense of this. I had a lot of fun with it, but though it wasn't as strong as the first film. Number 15, Transformers Rise of the Beasts. As far as the Transformers movies go, this is certainly one of the better ones. I get that that's not a high bar, but seriously, this movie was really fun. For those wondering, it is somewhat of a sequel to Bumblebee, but not directly. There's a throwaway line that confirms, yes, Bumblebee is still canon. This takes place a few years afterward in the 90s. And just like the Bumblebee movie, it very much feels like a film from the 90s. It's also very clearly trying to separate from and apologize for the Michael Bay films, because there's a few jokes that are sort of meta-humor, calling out some of the more problematic aspects of those films, 
maybe the infamously racist caricatures, but I don't know why they thought Pete Davidson would be a good choice for this. I personally find him unfunny and annoying talentless hack. So the main Autobot definitely should have been replaced with someone with a bit more charisma and charm. But all the other voice actors did a great job. There's some really cool character designs and the villain is very menacing. Now on a plot level, it's a bit clunky. At times, it can feel like it's trying to do too much at once, and it doesn't really pick up momentum until about the second half. But the human characters in this one are actually easy to care about, unlike the Bay films. And the action in this is the best of the franchise. It doesn't feel overindulgent, and holds back just enough to deliver just the right amount. However, the action at times can feel a bit derivative of the MCU. There are a few directions they take some of the characters, and I thought they were kind of shoehorned and silly. And speaking of the MCU, the cinematic universe this movie is trying to set up, I hope they follow through with. I won't spoil the twist, but it's teasing something that if it happens and they do it right, it will be one of the greatest geek movies ever. I thought this was fun, but I wish the plot had been a bit more coherent, because film will be proof they can make these movies with coherent plots, so I wish they had made a few more edits to the script. Number 14, Crater. It's a shame that this is no longer on Disney+, Plus, because if this went to theaters, I think it would make a decent amount of money, and I encourage Disney to try more original stuff like this. The film feels very much like a throwback to the kinds of kids' movies Spielberg would make in the 80s, specifically The Goonies. That's kind of what this is. It's The Goonies in space. The plot is vastly different, but the tone and way the kids interact is very reminiscent of it. The child cast is fantastic, they all work very well with each other, and they all feel genuine. The script has a really interesting story with lots of twists and intrigue. The film is exciting and has a lot of heart. It's not afraid to shy away from some more mature and heavier themes, while at the same time not going so far with it that it no longer becomes safe for kids to watch. And I'll admit, it did not end the way I thought it was going to, and it ended on a fantastically bittersweet note that will be both satisfied and tearing up. I do think there is a bigger story that could have been explored, though. I think they could have delved a bit deeper into this dystopian space society, but at the same time, I think keeping it a simple story also largely helped. Unfortunately, they pulled it from Disney Plus for tax reasons or something stupid like that, but I believe you can still buy it digitally on, like, Voodoo or Movies Anywhere. This is a movie that's fantastic for the entire family. If you grew up in the 80s and you want the same feeling you had when you saw kids' adventure movies like The Goonies, put this on, watch it with your kids, everyone's going to get something out of it. Number 13, The Creator. The visual effects. My word, if these visual effects don't get nominated for an Oscar next year, I will be very disappointed. And the film was also very well directed. A lot of the shots are very reminiscent of the director's previous films such as Godzilla and Rogue One, behind a very Vietnam War. What makes three films in a row now with that aesthetic? Gareth Edwards is a good director, but what is his obsession with the Vietnam War? Out of Edwards' three films, it's certainly the best paced. Godzilla doesn't show up until halfway through Godzilla. Now, let's be honest, as great as Rogue One is, does anything really happen until halfway through? Not really. His films generally take a while to get going, and on that level, it certainly has better pacing. Now, is it original? Kind of. Like I said, on a technical level, it's very impressive, but there are a few issues with the narrative. For one, the way the story flows feels very episodic. The film is divided into different segments such as The Friend, The Child, and they all feel like title cards for episodes. I don't feel there was enough time in movie format to develop everything that needed to be developed. I feel like this started out as a show, but the studio was too afraid to give it the budget it needed, so they forced the director to make it a movie. So as a consequence, it can be a bit underdeveloped. It also has quite a few similarities to films like Short Circuit and, Robot, and I, Robot, with the question of, what makes AI truly alive? Can it be alive if they qualify as human? And I'm sorry, but I didn't really feel much emotion for the main characters. I felt more emotion watching Alita Battle Angel than I did watching either of these two main characters. It's not a knock on the actors' performances, but rather the writing. Again, it's all very underdeveloped. It has great visuals, but on a narrative level, I feel it could have been written better by AI. Number 12, Asteroid City. An absolute delight. Now, I get Wes Anderson is not a director for everybody. He's definitely one of those directors that's an acquired taste. People either really like him or he's not their thing. And I totally get both sides of that. His films are very unconventional and you have to be in a very specific mood for them. And so obviously if Wes Anderson isn't your thing, this movie isn't going to change your mind. But as somebody who appreciates his films, I found this delightful. This isn't really a plot-driven film, it's definitely more of a character-driven film. You're spending time with these absurd characters or in these absurd situations, but they all play it so straight like it's completely normal. And that's part of the charm of this film. It is a fantastic cast playing all these wacky characters. The light delivery and script are incredibly quick and witty. The visual humor and dialogue are smart, and the film really rewards you for paying attention. Man, is this movie well made. The cinematography and effects are all fantastic. 
The film does a phenomenal job of transporting you to another time, the time of the 1950s. If you're a fan of Fallout and stuff like that, you'll probably really love this film, and it really delves into the 1950s aesthetic. The film has practical effects, and they're just cheap enough to feel like a B-movie from the 50s. The film also has just a ton of random, bizarre humor that's delivered sharply. Honestly, this is one of the best movies I've seen this year. I want to reward it for its originality and for being a film that the director and actors clearly put passion into and have fun making, but what holds it back is, even though the script is surprisingly relatively clean, only having one mild curse word for the entire film, there are unfortunately a couple of scenes of sexual content that honestly kind of push the PG-13 rating, and there wasn't any reason for them to be in there. There's not a character or plot reason for it, they're just there because Wes Anderson wanted an excuse to get Scarlett Johansson naked. If that wasn't in there, perfect day, 10 out of 10 movie, but I'm docking points for that. It felt gratuitous. That being said, it's a shame this movie is a smaller release with very little marketing, because its originality deserves to be rewarded. Hopefully this gets Oscar nominations next to word season so people will actually watch it. It is, it's an absurd, quirky, original, and delightful film. Number 11, TMNT Mutant Mayhem. The animation is incredibly unique. 30 years ago, it was only Pixar and DreamWorks that made these big budget CGI films. And even 80 years ago, it was just Disney and Warner Brothers as the big names in animation. But now, because of the advancements of technology, it seems that anybody can do animation. So there's a lot more competition. So other studios really need to stand out. The animation looks very grungy and very dirty. It doesn't look as polished as Pixar, but that's what gives it a unique look. This also probably has the best cast of a 2023 film except for Dungeons and Dragons. Everybody is in this movie. Jackie Chan, Paul Rudd, a lot of people involved in it, they all do a great job. It was also refreshing to see some more obscure Ninja Turtles villains get the spotlight in this film, because every Ninja Turtles film except for this one in the 2007 movie has always focused on Shredder, when there's so many other villains they could showcase, and they did that here. I loved all the new villains. The cast did a great job ripping off each other. It's also a very accessible film. The 90s film was still very trapped in that specific time period. The Michael Bay films did not really clear who the audience for those was. The 2007 film assumes you're already familiar with Ninja Turtles and get really confusing at points. This feels like the most accessible, especially for a new generation. It doesn't completely rehash the same origin stories as the other films, but at the same time, the new direction they take it doesn't feel like a betrayal. I also really enjoyed the little references and throwbacks to the other Ninja Turtles films. The action is fast-paced and fun to watch. It has a lot of great humor in it. Really, I only have a couple of issues with the film, which are the message about prejudice is very heavy-handed and repetitive. There is some about profanity, which is not needed. They could have easily said heck or dar, not the other words they do use. This is a family film. You don't need profanity. And this one is a silly nitpick. If all the turtles look very unique instead of just the same character design where the only difference is the color of the masks, the turtles are all different heights, different body types. But for some reason, Donatello has braces. Now, wait a minute. If they're not allowed to go to the surface, where did he get braces? Dumb nitpicks, I know. But I think this movie has a serious shot at being nominated for Best Animated Film at the Oscars. You could tell there was a lot of love put into it. They clearly have a lot of fun making it. They wanted to put out a great movie about a cheap IP cash grab, and they succeeded in the endeavor. The movie was totally awesome. And here we go, the top 10 movies of 2023. Number 10, The Hunger Games, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. Right off the bat, the aesthetic in this movie looks fantastic. The set designers, director, and cinematographer all did a great job of making the world of Pan Am look very depressing and war-torn. Now, a huge complaint that a lot of people have with the first movie was that none of the characters look starving. But in this one, they make sure they show you that, yes, the people in the districts are starving. The first time we see young Snow, he's basically skin and bones. The film does a great job of expanding the lore of the world of Pan Am. A lot of elements that were barely touched on are glossed over completely in the other films, such as the origin of the Mockingjays and the events that led to the capital starting the Hunger Games in the first place get explored a bit deeper here. The characters in this movie are all fantastic, and frankly, I actually cared about the love story between Snow and Lucy in this one, whereas in the Katniss films, I honestly didn't care less who she ended up with. I just wanted her to overthrow President Snow and found the love triangle aspect a bit thin. Here, I actually cared about Snow as a character and what happens with his relationship. The film does a great job of showing just how despicable the people of the capital are. It's already horrific that they're sending teenagers off to murder each other for sport, and here it makes that even worse by showing that the capital thinks that the tributes is nothing more than animals in a zoo, and not even children with disabilities such as a missing limb, blindness, or Down syndrome are spared from the horrors of the games. The capital even takes bets on who's going to last longest, and they even laugh when certain children are murdered. The film did a great job of making you feel angry for what they do. The cast in this film is fantastic. 
This is the first movie for Young Stowe's actor Tom Blythe, and he does a phenomenal job of showing the tragedy of what happens to his character as the events of the film get more and more tragic. Jason Schwartzman gives a great performance as the host of The Hunger Games. You hate his character because he's hosting such a horrific event, but he also brings such a charm to it at the same time, which is how the people of the capital are. Burt Gorman is great as the villain of the second half of the movie. Viola Davis gives a great performance as well. All around, a fantastic cast who give fantastic performances. I do recommend watching the other Hunger Games movies first, because a lot of the events and references are a little bit more meaningful, some in kind of a painful and tragically ironic way. If you've seen the other films and know what's being referenced, though some of the callbacks feel a bit forced. Now, unfortunately, the way the film is structured is a bit awkward. Similar to the Snyder Cut of Justice League or the film The Creator earlier this year, the film is divided into parts, so it feels more like a miniseries that was later edited into a film, but it, some of the time jumps and the transitions come a bit suddenly without much segue. I also feel like there was more story that could have been explored. With the first three Hunger Games films, they waited until the author had completed the trilogy of books before optioning them as films. But here, this feels like the first of a trilogy or the first season of a TV show. It doesn't really end with Snow's Rise to Power, it feels more like it to be continued. And the problem with that is that, as of me doing this video, there aren't any more books. And I haven't heard the author saying that she intends to continue the story. So, that's a shame. It feels like there's more compelling ideas about Snow's ascendancy and what led to him becoming as despicable as he is, but I blame that more on the author. If you're a Hunger Games fan, it's worth seeing. Number 9, Rebel Moon Part 1, A Child of Fire. Apparently this started out as a Star Wars movie, but for some reason Lucasfilm rejected it. I get that Zack Snyder as a director is a bit of an acquired taste, and his particular style isn't for everybody, but man did Lucasfilm miss out on keeping him. You can definitely see the Star Wars influences, particularly the grittier Star Wars projects of Rogue One and Ander. The film is visually stunning, the costumes and character designs make the world feel lived in, the world building is great, though again, heavily influenced by Star Wars, but honestly, I think for some, this film could be what the first Star Wars film was for a lot of people when that came out. It's a visual marvel, it has great action, and unique rules that make it feel like Snyder's own vision. Now, at points, the narrative can feel a bit episodic, and the film would have benefited from ending about five minutes earlier, but overall, this was fantastic. I'm excited to see this universe continue. Number 8, Dungeons & Dragons Honor Among Thieves. The filmmakers were smart because they put a lot of Easter eggs and references for those who are familiar with D&D, but they also made it accessible enough so everybody could enjoy it, whether or not they played it. It works perfectly on its own, just as a fantasy movie. The characters are all very likable and fun to watch interact with each other. I'd say this is like a fantasy version of Guardians of the Galaxy, a group of outlaws teaming up for redemption to get back what's been taken from them. Chris Pine's characters are swap swashbuckling quick with a leader like Star-Lord, there's a warrior woman like Amora, there's a sarcastic animal character like Rocket, and despite it being tied to Dungeons & Dragons, it has a fresh story. Even if it didn't have the D&D name attached to it, it would still work on its own and be a fantastic fantasy movie. This has the perfect amount of serious, as well as cheese. This is along the lines of Princess Bride, Willow, with just a hint of Monty Python sprinkled for good measure. It's serious and dramatic enough when it needs to be, and lighthearted and fun enough to keep you entertained. The script is quick-witted and sharp, the action is invigorating and exhilarating, and it's a movie that everyone can enjoy, and it rolls a perfect 20. Number 7, the Super Mario Brothers movie. This is probably the only video game movie that's accessible to everybody. There was a lot of passion, effort, and love put into this. The first 10 minutes alone have a ton of references and easter eggs to the world of Mario, and that's just in the first 10 minutes. In its quick but effective 80 minute runtime, there are plenty more. Mario fans have an absolute smorgasbord of references, and it works even if you're not super deep into the Mario lore. This is a very crowd-pleasing film that can be enjoyed by everybody, even if you haven't played a Mario game in your life. The world of this movie is very bright and vibrant and is super fun to spend time in. The characters and world are incredibly well animated with a ton of expression, but it's also careful not to be too exaggerated. And while the plot does move a little fast, there is also not much to plot to draw from from the games as honestly they're relatively simple. But that's also part of the charm. Now when the trailer came out, people were very divided on the casting of Chris Pratt as Mario, and in my opinion, I think for the most part Pratt did a great job. The voice acting in the film is nearly seamless, feeling true to the spirit of the characters. Every once in a while, Pratt's real voice will seep through, but it's honestly not that big of an issue. The best performance in this film by far is Jack Black as Bowser. He absolutely steals the show, has a ton of fun, and is unrecognizable. The only time it sounds like Black is when he sings his villain song, but when he speaks, it's a totally different voice that feels perfect for Bowser. The only performance I had an issue with was Seth Rogen as Donkey Kong. Even then, it wasn't a bad performance, it just that it sounds exactly like Seth Rogen. Everyone else has tried their hardest to make the performances feel like the characters, 
Then he got Sith Rogue and just said he like himself, not even bothering to disguise his voice even a bit. It fits the character to some degree, but also makes it harder to separate the two. I do have one or two issues, mainly that there's no reason to pop songs in this film, and it honestly doesn't fit. There's a training montage when Mario first enters the Mushroom Kingdom, where he's trying to learn about the power-ups, and it's straight out of one of the Mario platformers, but instead of using the actual Mario music, which would have fit for the scene much better, they instead use the song I Need a Hero. There's another scene that uses the song Thunderstruck, which again, could have just been score for the games. Now, it's something like Shrek using real-world songs that a fantasy setting works, because it's anachronistic. But in this film, it feels out of place. Those aren't totally glaring issues, but they did leave me somewhat bewildered. The Super Mario Brothers movie is a wildly entertaining crowd pleaser, perfect for all ages, and it's definitely worth the coins. Number six, The Flash. Very rarely do I say that DC did something better than Marvel, but if we're comparing movies whose plot involves a character with superpowers, who dresses in red, and tries to use time travel to bring their family back, it's done a lot better in this film than it was done in Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness. If you saw my AMC rankings, you know I'm not fond of that movie. I found it very dark and unnecessarily occult. This film takes some of the ideas, but presents them in a more upbeat way, and with stronger character development. Right from the opening scene, the film is engaging, and much like the main character in The Flash, the film doesn't slow down. It's got fantastic action, a terrific plot, and a great cast. Michael Keaton, of course, returns to the role of Batman after over 30 years, and it's like he never left. His return to the Cape and Cowl feels very natural, and what they do with this character in this film feels like a very fitting continuation. There's also a fan service called Lore. Keep your eyes peeled for cameos. Some are familiar, some are deep cuts, and this isn't a movie where there's cameos or references every 30 seconds, it's still a very plot-focused movie. It isn't like a lot of Marvel event movies where the main character's name is in the title, but it doesn't feel like their film because there's too many other characters distracted from it, such as Captain America Civil War. As awesome as that movie is, it's not really a Captain America movie, it's an Avengers movie. This still very much feels like a Flash movie. He is the one that goes through the most character growth, and he's written very well. A few issues are, though, that on a plot level, this is a time travel movie, so you get a lot of the time travel movie cliches. Dialogue about fixed points in time, messing with time travel and messes things up, how timelines work, it all feels very derivative of Doctor Who, Avengers Endgame, stuff like that. There's also a few scenes in this new timeline that Barry creates that feel like they were taken from the movie Last Action Hero. But honestly, this film is a lot of fun. It manages to be nostalgic while not being distracting. It's a ton of fun at the faction scenes, it's got great hearts, it's got great characters, it's everything you want in a movie like this, and it's very much a love letter to DC fans. Number 5, Mission Impossible Reckoning, Part 1. This franchise continues to amaze me with how they keep managing to outdo themselves with every new entry. Now, I've said in the past to, on my now-defunct blog before I started this channel that on a plot level, the Mission Impossible movies all feel kind of the same. But that's okay, because at this point, we don't see them for the plot. We see them for the stunts. They're kind of like the Fast and Furious franchise that way. I'm happy to say this plot feels a bit new and different than the other ones. However, the thread of the plot will feel a bit dated in a few years. Unlike the previous films where the threat is rival country trying to send missiles or poison the water or get government secrets, the villain in this film is an evil AI, which now marks the third movie where Tom Cruise fighting against evil AI, the other two being Minority Report and Oblivion. I get that they wanted to make something that's a hot button topic right now, but in a few years the plot for this movie will probably show its age. Rival countries threatening America is always going to be a relevant topic. It's been that way ever since the James Bond franchise, and there's a reason it's used in other spy thrillers like Jack Ryan. However, the commentary on AI will set this movie back a few years instead of feeling timeless. And what this AI can do is at times a bit far-fetched, while the previous films in this franchise have all been somewhat grounded in realism, except for Tom Cruise's over-the-top stunts, of course. My other issue is that while the third act and honestly the whole movie are fantastic, third act's climax feels a bit reused from the first movie. However, the way it's done in this film is like a better version of it, which makes sense. This is a 2023 film as opposed to 1996. But honestly, those are my only issues with the film. Even then, they're small nitpicks. This film reminded me of some of my favorite non-Avengers MCU movies. I gravitate more towards the ones where the action is more street level, such as Captain America the Winter Soldier, and that's kind of what this feels like. I want Christopher McQuarrie to do an MCU film. Let's see what he can bring to the table. He might bring something unique instead of formulaic like a lot of the MCU recently. Haley Atwell stars alongside Tom Cruise in this film, and she has such a great dynamic with him, and is also a compelling character. Now, on a stunt level, it of course outdoes the other films. There was quite a bit of silence during these scenes, and I could feel the audience in my theater holding their breath of anticipation. These are the most exciting stunts and action scenes yet. Now, of course, this is part one, so it should go without saying that this film ends in a cliffhanger, but I think it's a great cliffhanger. Nothing feels like it could be a fake-out or that nothing matters. 
I actually felt with this cliffhanger that there were real stakes, and I'm highly anticipating part two, though I would have gladly had this be a four-hour movie, because it's just that fantastic. Number four, Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 3. The stakes for this movie are incredibly high, the characters all get satisfying arcs, and they all work extremely well off each other. And unlike a lot of MCU sequels that forgot what the previous films set up and don't follow through with, such as Baron Bordo and Doctor Strange, everything set up in the previous films comes back and feels important. The stakes of the plot revolve around Rocket Raccoon. And unlike in movies such as Black Panther Wakanda Forever, where characters like Riley Williams feel more like plot devices rather than actual characters, Rocket is an actual character in this film, not a MacGuffin. The way each character's arc ends is incredibly satisfying. Out of the three Guardians films, this is definitely the one with the most heart. I'd say it's almost perfect, but unfortunately what does hold it back is a pattern I'm noticing with these films. Sometimes they are afraid to show too much negative emotion. There are some very dark moments in the film, and sometimes instead of letting the audience feel the weight, try to light things up with jokes that can feel a bit ill-timed. I know you want to lighten the tension, but sometimes it's more effective to let the audience feel something else. Another element that holds it back a bit is something that bogs down a lot of the new MCU projects. They expect you to have watched everything with these characters. If you go into this movie not having watched the Guardians of the Galaxy Holiday Special on Disney+, Plus, you're going to be a bit confused at the beginning. There are certain characters and plot lines from that special that come back and are important, but if you haven't watched it or watched it recently, you're going to be a bit confused. However, apart from needing to watch the Holiday Special, this is a film that feels very focused on its own narrative. It isn't trying to set up the next ten movies and shows. It feels like it stands on its own story. What they do with certain characters is plan they could bring them back if they want to, but it doesn't feel like a priority. This feels like a movie made by a filmmaker, not by a studio. It doesn't feel like that. It feels like a movie that was made the way James Gunn wanted to make it, and I'm not trying to work around 10,000 studio notes. It's an incredibly satisfying emotional end to the Guardians trilogy. Number three, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. This will go down in history as one of the best films of all time, animated or otherwise. This will be talked about in the same conversation as Empire Strikes Back and Infinity War as one of the best sequels of all time. It's everything a sequel should be. It expands the ideas from the first one, and it gets even stronger character growth from returning characters, while also introducing new ones. Everything done right about the first one is done even better here. There is more emotion, more action, higher stakes, and it's got the trademark Lord and Miller humor from their other animated films like The Lego Movie and Missions vs. Machines, while also having enough serious drama, heart, and dark moments to balance it out. I am so jealous of the kids that get to grow up with this movie. This is beyond anything you'll ever want in the Spider-Man movie. It starts with incredibly high stakes and only rolls faster from there. It's all killer, no filler. Number two, Sound of Freedom. Much like a war movie, a movie about slavery, or a movie about the Holocaust, this is not a movie that is glamorous. This is not a movie for fun escapism. It's quite heavy, but it's also extremely important. Unlike the 10,000 superhero movies we get every year, the evil of the film does not end when the credits roll. Very real evil forces are still working in this world to keep the human trafficking industry afloat. This is a movie that will stick with you forever, and we can want to do something. This is not a movie with over-the-top action like Taken. This is a much more dramatic, serious, heavy film. It manages to do something a lot of films like this tend to do poorly. It presents the issue strongly, while keeping anything explicit implied, which I feel was much more effective. When I say I never want to watch this movie again, I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean the movie is just that heavy and elicits such strong emotions. It's a hard issue, but it's a viral issue. Your gut will retch, you will cry, and that's a good thing. The message of the film is the most important message you can convey. It's thought provoking, emotional, and compelling. And for a while, it was my number one pick. But my number one pick just came out a few weeks ago, and that number one pick is... The Shift. If you want to see an original sci-fi movie that does the multiverse concept in a way that hasn't really been done before, this is that movie. Now, this is put out by a Christian studio, the director, as well as myself, are very openly Christian, but it isn't done in a way that completely alienates a mainstream audience either. It's more like Narnia, where yes, if you're a Christian, you're going to get more out of it, but you can still enjoy the story and characters no matter what you believe. This is like that. It's essentially a modern-day sci-fi retelling of the story of Job. And even if you don't read the Bible, there's still a lot of power in this movie, because a big part of life is pain and suffering. We've all felt alone at some point in life. We've all felt hopeless. It's like in It's a Wonderful Life, where Jimmy Stewart's character is at his lowest point and he just decides, I'm done. I'm going to throw myself off this bridge, before his guardian angel stops him to show why his life has value and meaning. This is a film that shows no matter how low things get for you, there is eventually a light of hope. Yes, the film does have a dark, intense, dystopian tone, but that's to build up to the message of hope. 
The feel of it does feel very Orwellian, with Neil McDonough playing the villain, the benefactor, who's now going for the devil. And that's sort of the Big Brother 1984 vibe. Now, if you've seen my MC rankings, you know that I absolutely hate Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness. Because again, as a Christian, I found the movie super dark, graphically violent, and occult. This has a lot of similar ideas about the main character looking into the concept of multiverse trying to get his family back, but the way this film does it does feel a lot less dark. This is more Star Wars level dark. And unlike Multiverse of Madness, which ended up turning the main characters into villains at the end, there is actually a feel-good message. It's like how when Narnia came out, we got the Golden Compass shortly after. One was Christian, one was Atheist. And I appreciate how this movie shows the devil for who he truly is. There are a lot of shows that I don't watch, like Good Omens, Miracle Workers, or Lucifer that mock God and portray the devil as the cool good guy. This shows the devil for who he truly is, someone who delights in causing your pain and suffering. And the dialogue they give him about how God allowing bad things to happen to you must mean he doesn't love you is exposed as the lie that it is. This feels very reminiscent of C.S. Lewis's The Screwtape Letters, where the tricks of life the devil uses are exposed. Even if you're not Christian, if you just want to see this as a different kind of dystopian sci-fi movie, you're at a low point in your life and you want a message of hope, especially now that we're in the holiday season where a lot of you may feel alone for one reason or another, I highly recommend this movie. You never know. It might change your whole outlook of life for the better, and it highly deserves to come in at number one as the best movie of 2023. Let me know what your top 10 best movies of the year were, and I will see you next time.